Rick Doblin. <laughs> How are you, my friend? Uh, well rested and super excited to be here with you today. Well, I I gotta say I'm thrilled to be here with you. I um I really admire you. Oh. <laughs> and I, I salute you for the work that you're doing in the world to bring relief yeah. to so many that are suffering, to alleviate human suffering. I mean, if there's ever been a solid reason to get out of bed in the morning, <laughs> it is to serve f our fellow our fellow man, right? And to help others. Yeah, I've been fortunate in the sense that I've been driven by this... Um, the fear of um, what people can do to each other when their irrational elements take over. Interesting. The, the, the fear of um, the Holocaust, the fear of dehumanizing others, and that's what led me to really focus on psychedelics. But I've had um, such a loving family and such support that the fear has been not overwhelming, but a powerful, powerful motivating force. Well, that's the interesting thing about fear, right? That fear can drive us to such madness and such cruelty, but it can also, in the right interpretive framework, yeah, fear can actually fuel our desire, capacity, and willingness to extend our hands towards one another, to bring others into awareness, really. You know, there's a great quote I once came across um, and it said that empathy rarely extends beyond our line of sight, right? Em empathy rarely extends beyond our line of sight. And that actually makes a lot of sense because then, you know, what is out of sight is out of mind. So the question becomes then how do we, well, how do we extend our line of sight? How do we expand our compassion? Well, and we do it through insight. Interesting. <laughs> Tell me more. Well, the insight that we're connected mm. to everything, that we're mm. connected to the Amazon burning, that we're connected to refugees from um, Syria, mm. finding nowhere to take them in, that we're connected through this insight, through this um, common humanity, common life on this planet, so that our sight then can extend and we yeah. can be compassionate for the whole planet. So a change in consciousness beyond the broadcasts of the ego to the broadcasts of the whole yes. is what is needed, which reminds me of that South African saying, Ubuntu, I am because you are, mm. which is beautiful. And, and it's funny, just this morning, I was reading an article in Aeon magazine uh -huh. that was drawing an analogy um, between astronauts when they go into orbit and, and, and that cognitive shift that occurs mm -hmm. when they see the planet as a whole thing, the overview effect. Yeah. Um, and they were saying that that is analogous to the experience that many people are having now with psychedelic psychotherapy. Yeah. And all of a sudden they're starting to see this kind of bigger picture perspective and identifying with something larger than themselves and how that has all of these immense benefits to, yeah. the, to mental health. Yeah, and I think what often people get confused about is that when you have this larger consciousness, it doesn't mean that you lose sight of who you are mm. in your individual life. Mm. So we talk about ego death, mm -hmm. and I don't think it's really ego death. It's more ego moves into the background from being in the foreground. Mm -hmm. And so you're part of a larger world, but you don't disappear. And I think that's really reassuring to people to realize that you can be this... Uh, consciousness of the entire history of the universe, but you still have a role between life and death that you don't disappear. And the other aspect of this is my um, youngest daughter, Ellie, um, one of her closest friends uh -huh. in school, uh -huh. her grandfather was Michael Collins, huh. who was on the Apollo when Neil Armstrong, yeah. you know, and uh, walked on the earth, uh, walked on the moon. Wow. And so what Michael said uh, to her, uh, was so beautiful was that after they traveled around the world, after they came back from the moon and they traveled for different countries, the feeling was not that we Americans had, did th had done this, but we humans had done this. Sure. And that was, the, again, that ego shifting from us being in the foreground to us being in the background mm. as part of this bigger picture. That's really well put because I think some of the reservations that some people have about having an experience of ego death is not so much 
the cognitive benefits that might ensue. That sounds amazing, but it's the idea that you have to die in order to experience that radical interconnection. And and there is terror about yeah. submitting completely to your own dissolution of self, you know? Um, but, you know, you once used an analogy when comparing maybe like LSD and MDMA. You told me that, you know, whereas LSD might smash your lenses of perception, something like MDMA in that it's a little more gentler, uh, a little more gentle, a little more empathogenic, actually just kind of clean, cleans the windshield of your lenses of perception, but doesn't completely shatter them. Is that is that yeah. an accurate statement? Yeah, what I'd like to say is that, uh, you know, MDMA is like the diamond polisher uh-huh. and LSD is like the diamond cutter. Interesting. Well, that's really and, well And put. also that there's another way to think about it, that LSD moves you, um, if we want to say the sun, you, you know, moves you towards the larger universe, mm-hmm. um, dissolves the ego in certain ways mm-hmm. and moves you to the larger universe so you can see a bigger picture. Mm-hmm. But MDMA grounds you so comfortably in the earth mm. that then you can see the bigger picture. You're not trapped in your subjectivity. Well, that's uh, that's very beautiful. And And... You know, this gets us obviously to the subject at hand and the subject <laughs> of your work. You know, I am, I am very interested in 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 consciousness, and I have always been driven by, by the question. Right? There's a great line. Um, I forget. I think it's Walker Percy who said it. He said, "The search is what anyone would undertake if they were not sunk in the everydayness of their own lives to become aware." of the possibility of the search is to be on to something. Well, and not to be on to something is to be in despair. <laughs> and so this, this, this search, this existential agitation has always driven me. Like, what are we to do in the face of our mortality? What are we to do in the face of our finitude? What are we to do with ourselves? And when you keep reading about, on the one hand, our astounding technological progress, you know, the planet cloaked in connectivity, (laughs) human beings transcending time and distance with wireless communication technologies that dazzle. You flew across across the the, the country yesterday on a machine with a million moving parts. So we are more connected than ever before. And yet, subjectively, there is this consistent report of people feeling disconnected and alienated from one another. And, And the United Nations put out a number recently, said more people are committing suicide now than are dying from natural disasters and armed conflict combined. So yeah, yay that armed conflict and natural disasters are killing less people, but WTF that we're killing ourselves in suicide like well in america last year more americans died of drug overdoses mm. than died than americans died in the entire vietnam afghanistan and iraq wars so in one year more americans died of drug overdoses mm. than americans died in those three wars we should make a distinction between what drugs we're talking about here not from psychedelics not at all from psychedelics okay. not at all well, and I think Talk psychedelics can be the solution for some people who yeah. are trapped in addiction. But I'd also like to say that um, Albert Einstein had a quote that mm. I resonate with a lot, mm-hmm. which was that our technology has exceeded our humanity. Mm. So we are wrapped in this incredible technology. Mm. And what we've been able to do over, let's say, the last 500 years or so is sort of by um, putting science over religion. Mm-hmm. Science has been able to, with our rational mind, mm-hmm. make enormous progress. But we're in many ways an insane species, destroying the world, destroying the environment, uh, destroying each other, building more weapons of mass destruction. And we don't have the humanity, we don't have the emotional capacity, the spirituality to deal with the technology. And yeah. so that's what, in 1972, at age 18, led me to realize that how do we help expand our humanity and for me that turned out to be psychedelics and yeah. then the more i studied it i realized that we've been we as humans have been using that for thousands of years and that rather than continue to develop my mind what i really needed to do is get more in balance and so that's where i dropped out of college for 10 years <laughs> yeah well that that's very interesting i mean even this phrase that our technology has exceeded our humanity um i think speaks to the fact that what is urgently needed is is on a cultural scale a, yeah. a shift in consciousness and a shift in 
our existential orientation and our North Star, the story that we tell ourselves about ourselves. The current one is no longer convincing to many. And whereas maybe traditional religion is not the answer, people still need a North Star. They need an orientation, right? They need a poetic truth that is yeah. beyond the literal grid, beyond the reality that we are born and that we die. Like, why are we here and why does it matter? And so, yeah, talk about tapping into heart and intuition and empathy and compassion for our fellow man. What is truly needed is a change in consciousness. And you talk about psychedelics as playing a crucial role in this. Well, what are ultimately psychedelics? Well, they are also technologies, but they are different sorts of technologies. They are ecstatic technologies. They are technologies of inner space, right? Stanislav Grof famously mm. said about LSD, but I think you could draw that conclusion about other psychedelics. They could do for psychiatry what the telescope did for astronomy. <laughs> and so this is exciting. This is an exciting time to be alive. Exactly. And if you look at what uh, struggles people had who early on used the telescope mm. with Galileo, Oh, and, uh, what would happen? They would they would look at the through the telescope and have a bad trip. <laughs> no, they would see things that the society wasn't ready for. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It wasn't so much that they had a bad trip, but that they had a good trip, and they saw things that were ahead of their time. They couldn't integrate it. And one one of as long as we're talking about quotes, one yeah. of my my favorite quote, which speaks a lot to courage and holding to that truth, mm. is that one of the people that was early on accepting the. Uh, Copernican revolution and the, mm -hmm. the information that Galileo got from the telescope was a, a, a Roman Catholic mm -hmm. priest called Father Bruno. Mm. And because he challenged the current world view at the time that the earth was the center of the universe, he was condemned to die and to be burned at the stake mm. by the Inquisition. Mm. And what he said after he was sentenced mm. to the uh, judges there from the Inquisition, he said, your fear in condemning me is greater than my fear in being condemned. That they were so scared of what it would mean for them to mm. have to reorient their That's right. structures That's right. and that they couldn't go through yeah. that ego death. They were so trapped in who they thought they were That's and right. what they thought the universe was and that they were at the center of things yes. and they had all the power. They couldn't yeah. see beyond that. So they were terrified of the truth more than he was terrified of being burned at the stake. And and actually there's a psychological theory that accounts for that, that actually mm. builds on the work of Ernest Becker. So Ernest Becker wrote the 1974 Pulitzer Prize winning book, The Denial of Death, mm. which placed death anxiety mm -hmm. as the sort of worm at the core of human neuroses, right? Mm -hmm. Kind of displacing the, the Freudian idea that we're just sexually repressed and that's mm -hmm. why we're neurotic. Yeah. But it's actually because we are repressing the fundamental disquiet of knowing that we are mortal. Like that every day we get out of bed and we have the, we trivialize our lives with trivialities, but in the grand face of it, everyone you know and everyone you love is going to be taken away from you and you're going to die to disappear forever. Like, what the fuck? And from that, these, these psychologists develop something called terror management theory. Mm -hmm. And terror management theory basically says that if you remind somebody of their mortality, for the most part, essentially, my understanding is that two things can happen. But what tends to happen a lot of the time is that they become more aggressive and unkind towards others. Mm -hmm. Now, some people, you remind them of their mortality and they become more compassionate. Yeah. But the idea behind this theory is what they sort of derive from that is that when you have a cultural worldview, right, that you cling for dear life to, right, yeah. because this cultural house of cards is your existential blanket. Right, I am an American, or I am Venezuelan, or I am Catholic, and Jesus loves me, or whatever, whatever the thing that you're clinging to for meaning, right, mm -hmm. is any other or alternative interpretation or cultural worldview that is presented to you in your face, right, is actually perceived as a physical attack on your person. And so people respond to it as if you were trying to kill them. And that explains, yeah. for example, this example of the, of the telescope is that, you know, yeah. this was a machine, right? An instrument that was threatening to so fundamentally shift our ontology, yeah. right? That on the one hand, wow, it could have like been an overview effect for the planet. But the powers that be were like, this is an existential threat to our hierarchical power structure and our interpretive frameworks. We have to burn this person at the stake, Right. You know, and so that's a really interesting insight into how strongly we cling 
or can cling to our belief system. Yeah, and I would say that the the, the main challenge that we face now as a species and also as uh, political activists mm-hmm. is to help people move away from fundamentalism, from literalism, mm-hmm. into mysticism. And this idea for me was really confirmed by Robert Mueller, who was the Assistant Secretary General of the United Nations. And in 1983, he wrote a book called New Genesis, Mm. Shaping a Global Spirituality. Mm. And again, global spirituality doesn't mean that individual religions disappear, we have one world religion. It just means that we see that religions are like languages. Mm -hmm. They're all attempts to communicate the same kind of things. And one language is different than the other, but it doesn't mean French is better than German or German is better than English. And if we can help people surrender that grasp on the literal and move into the poetic, the symbolic, that's what we need to do. That's our challenge. Is to And in this increasing globalization world, cultures are no longer isolated from each other, mm. where they, they have to confront the fact that... Yeah. That they other, have different other, interpretive frameworks. And other people have said, this is the way to spirituality, yeah. or this is our... Uh, priest, or this is our founder, sure. or, or Buddha, Muhammad, you know, Jesus, mm. Moses, whatever mm-hmm. ones, mm-hmm. that there has to be this way where we can appreciate differences and celebrate them rather than be terrified by them. Yeah. You know, when I when I spoke to Eric Davis, who wrote mm-hmm. uh, Technosis, yeah. um, he brought up the work of Bruno Latour, I believe, mm-hmm. who talked about different modes of being. And I think that making sense with these different, or making peace with the different modes of being, you know, finding a way for contradictions to be reconciled or embracing a kind of paradoxicality when you can hold multiple truths in mind at once is the way we get there. You know, one example being, again, art and science, right? Or the poetic and the literal. You know, for example, mythology and archetype. Vital, I think, to our to our well-being, storytelling. Human beings are storytelling animals. We think in metaphors and archetypes. It's how we make sense of ourselves. It's how we contextualize our lives, right? But what is a myth? A myth is false from the outside, but true from the inside, right? Right. right. Or Eric Davis says these kinds of experience can be taken, you know, experiences of the mythic and the transcendent must be taken seriously, but they don't have to be taken literally. Exactly. That's how the poetic avoids turning into militant scripture. That's how you avoid creating a new religion and becoming a self-righteous mouthpiece for everyone else. But it doesn't mean that you have to let go of your own personal poetic truth. Alan de Botton, the British philosopher, has a very similar line. And this is, this is something that just resonates with me infinitely. He says, yes, look, a, a journalist or, or a scientist or a literal-minded person might be more accurate in describing the details of an event than a poet. But a poet may nevertheless reveal truths of a deeper sort that are beyond the literal grid. Very much so. And that's it, right there. Ursula Le Guin, science describes accurately from the outside. Poetry describes accurately from the inside. Science explicates. Poetry implicates. Well, even Albert Einstein said um, that there's really no conflict between true science and true religion. There's conflict between false science and false religion, but Mm. there's no conflict between what we understand in terms of values and spirituality and what we understand through science, that there are literal views that may not be upheld by science, but those are not the deepest views. Something you said earlier really resonated with me about uh, how we trivialize our lives, but also how we end up helping people to look at a deeper truth. Yeah. And so it, it reminded me of uh, the need hierarchies of Abraham Maslow. I love Abraham Maslow. Hierarchy of needs, yes. Yeah, and how I think what is enabling Trump to succeed so well, mm-hmm. I mean, not that he, in his own terms, is that he's playing on people's fears and anxieties because their basic survival needs are being challenged, yeah. you know, with technological change. Oh, with, yeah. You know, the robotic and all sorts of ways in which people's jobs and how they get income and how they survive are being challenged. So as long as people are at that level of survival needs, they find it hard to see the bigger picture. And so that's where we need to find a way to, in a compassionate world, to share the resources, not have them all accumulate with a few people at the top, Mm -hmm. and that then people will have that sense of security that they can move from that as a base. Yeah 
towards looking at their fears and their, their anxieties and how people might be different from them, their prejudices. Well, but we need to have that basic sense of security. I agree. And I think that populists in general, they either intuitively or, or Machiavellian, in a Machiavellian fashion, they exploit people's existential fears about their basic needs not being met. I mean, the whole Maslow hierarchy of needs is like, well, look, if you have to eat, nothing else matters. But once you've been fed, then maybe you kind of want a roof over your head. And once you've got a roof over your head, well, maybe you want like a sense of esteem and belonging. Yeah. And then once you've got that, you're like, you want to make some wealth. And then once you got that, you're like, what's it all about, Alfie? You know what I mean? Like, yeah. Well, so, a, lot of, a lot of people also aren't aware of a transition that Maslow made in the last few years of his life mm, towards peak experience. Is well, that the well, no. beyond that. Okay. So, so the um, well, in a way, yes, that. Yeah. So, so that pe- Abraham Maslow's need hierarchy for most people still in many textbooks. Yeah. The top of that is self actualization, mm-hmm. that you become your full self. Yeah. That, um, you know, and that is in some ways like the libertarian ideal. Sure. You know that we all have this ability to actualize ourselves. Mm-hmm. And, and that once you've got your security needs taken care of and your belonging needs, then then you can kind of, you know, f- full flower into mm-hmm. your nature. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But because of peak experiences, because of psychedelic experiences, in the last few years of his life, Abraham Maslow, who previously had helped start humanistic psychology, mm. which does have this idea of um, positive psychology, mm-hmm. self actualization, yeah. he also, with Stan Groff and a few others, started transpersonal psychology. Ah, and so the beyond self, beyond self. So self transcendence uh-huh. is actually at the top of Maslow's hierarchy. Oh, so after self actualization, after it's self transcendence. Yes, and so it's service to others. Beautiful. It's you become part of this larger thing. It's not just about yourself anymore. It's not just about your own full actualization. It's about transcending the self and helping everybody get to that place. And you know what? It feels like Mother Nature has our back on this. You've probably heard of the Helper's High, right? Mm. The helper's high says that on a neurochemical level, we get uh, reward. We get like pleasure chemistry circulating in our brains when we help other people. Yeah. So it's like there's this kind of, there's an incentive, there's a reward pathway here to extend our hands towards one another. And I think what is, what is realized, what is, what is required is for people just to realize this, to come around, to see that by helping others, they're helping themselves too. Yeah. Mirror you know, neurons too, totally. of how we can really uh, respond to other people. Yeah. So let's get into this. You know, you started MAPS, right? The Multidisciplinary <laughs> Association for Psychedelic Studies. You had yeah, an ontological yeah. shift when you had a psychedelic yeah. experience and you were like, yeah. if everybody was able to have an experience similar to this, you know, we could mend our suffering, heal our brokenness, and move towards the next step in our evolution. And you've had remarkable progress in <laughs> in in kind of putting a suit and tie yeah, around yes. the seriousness of a psychedelic experience and putting away the tie-dye shirts and finding ways to integrate this and going through the proper channels to bring this into mainstream acceptance, you know? <laughs> You know, I, actually, it's so interesting you use that metaphor, the suit and tie, because for so many of our events and speeches, I wear a suit and tie. Yeah. And lately, on a few occasions, I've no longer been doing that. Uh-huh. And for me, that's a sign of progress. That was a symbol sure. that I'm willing to bring the psychedelics into mainstream society and work within and grow from within. Yeah. And I feel that we've accomplished a lot so that that symbolic participation in the mainstream um, doesn't need to be so literal anymore. Although I'm going to be giving a a talk tomorrow where I'm going to be wearing a suit and tie um, to a group of um, people who are um, what's called the uh, Institutional Review Board, the Western IRB, who who review our studies and other studies. And they've invited me. Just to give you a historical sense how incredible it is. um, So in 2003... We got permission for the first study with uh, MDMA for post-traumatic stress disorder, and the permission was from the FDA. And then we had to get permission from the Institutional Review Board, which um, colleges, universities, hospitals, they all have these institutional review boards. They were created after the Nuremberg trials, Uh after the Nazi experiments on unwilling volunteers who were not really volunteers, and many of them killed in these experiments. So the Institutional Review Boards were created for human rights, for scientific research. And mm-hmm. so this Western IRB approved our study, 
And then a month later, we got a letter from them saying we've revoked the approval and we believe we, we've called independently a certain number of people and they say that MDMA is terribly dangerous and you've misled us and one dose could be permanent brain damage and it's a terrible thing and we're no longer going to support this study. And so we ended up in about a six-month negotiations with them where we got experts from all different scientific fields to write letters to them. And then at the end of this, they said, it's not really about the science. It's about the politics. We want to have nothing to do with MDMA. Here's your money back, which they never do, and just go away. And the problem is that once you get rejected by one IRB, then the next IRB, you have to tell them what happened with the first IRB. Mm -hmm. And so that sort of brings this stigma forward and forward. And mm -hmm. eventually we went through seven IRBs. All of them either refused to work with us or looked at it for a while and then said, we're just never going to approve it. Mm. So then MAPS, as an institution, I said, all right, we're going to start our own IRB. We can do that. I read all the regulations. We started our own IRB. And then I said, okay, well, I'm relaxed. We can do this research. But before we go ahead, I'm going to try one more time because it's not so great to from an optics to approve your own mm -hmm. studies, mm -hmm. even though it would be an independent group of IRB. So I read the list of uh, private IRBs. There were about 28 of them, and one of them was called Copernicus mm -hmm. IRB. And I thought if any IRB is willing to acknowledge yeah. the scientific suppression from religion and politics, it would be Copernicus IRB. And as it turned out, they were willing to work with us. Beautiful. It took a long time. but um, So in 2004, we were finally able to start the first study for MDMA for PTSD. We've been working with Copernicus IRB um, this whole time. And several years ago, to my utter shock and surprise, Copernicus IRB was bought by the Western IRB. Funny. The one that rejected us yeah. at the very beginning. Yeah. And But things have changed so much. So now I've been invited by the Western IRB to give a talk to their staff, to their training, yeah. to the people that they work with. Mm -hmm. And so well, it feels like, changed from the inside out. I mean, and you feel it. I mean, I, I haven't opened uh, my Facebook feed once in the last <laughs> six months or my Twitter feed where there hasn't been some glowing article about psychedelic psychotherapy. Yeah. Right. And, you know, yeah. it's amazing whether it's the, the Johns Hopkins stuff happening with psilocybin for end of life anxiety, the MDMA stuff that MAPS has been doing around PTSD. I mean, you just see like every week there's another study using psychedelics to help alleviate some form of mental distress. And then Robin Cardhart Harris and the Imperial College of London and his team, they came up with this kind of theory that it encompasses all mental illnesses. Right. I believe yeah. they call it the entropic brain. And they talk yeah. about like your sense of self or the default mode network in the brain becoming like over rigid and over vigilant, you know, for whatever reason, whatever your trauma was, whatever it is that sidelined you at some point in your life that left a scar that made your ego move into the realm of becoming a tyrant. And then yeah. that's characterized by obsessive thinking, intrusive thoughts and rumination, which again affects anxiety. This plays out in depression, plays out in anorexia, plays out uh -huh. in all these illnesses seem to share this signature of rigidity yeah. in the brain. Yeah. And then the, the whole metaphor is that these psychedelics or these ecstatic technologies can kind of have a shaking the snow globe like effect, which can yeah. bring this increased clarity that when yeah. you're stuck behind your own lenses, hyper rigid lenses of perception, you can't see. Right, because you see with your lenses and you see through your lenses, yeah. but only when you have a psychedelic experience do you become aware that you have lenses. Yeah. That's what seems to happen. You bump up a level, and now you see your own lenses, and then you can be like, "Oh, this is not serving me." <laughs> so then you can dispense with the lenses. And what's interesting about that interpretation is that it allows us not to contend with the poetic aspect of the contents of people's experiences. When you take MDMA or LSD or psilocybin and you feel like you commune with the cosmos and or have a divination of the great beyond, and uh -huh. that's the experience, the mystical experience that cures you in a measurable, quantifiable way, we don't have to get into the literal truth of that experience. That can stay in the realm yes. of poetic truth. It's like separating church and state. Yeah. All we care about is that we can quantifiably measure increased trait openness, increased engagement with the world, no longer meeting the criteria for these pathologies. That's the only thing that we need to show as science. The contents of the experience, those are for you. Church right. and state, separate. Yeah. Does that now, make sense? Uh, yeah, it does make sense, although I'd, I'd like to refine this a tiny bit in the sense mm -hmm. that 
Some people have said MDMA is not a real psychedelic, mm -hmm. that, that it doesn't dissolve get into the that, ego please. in the yeah. same sense. Yeah. So I think there's two fundamental therapeutic mechanisms okay. operating here. Okay. One is you, you talked about the default mode network, mm -hmm. which basically means um, that's our sense of self in the brain, our ego sense, and that's scanning the world according to our Maslow need hierarchies. Mm -hmm. So we filter all the information that comes in about what are our needs, and that's being done through this um, default mode network. And when you weaken the default mode network, you see the broader world. Again, the self moves from foreground, the ego moves from foreground to background, the self, the larger self moves from background to foreground, and then that's tremendously healing for people. Mm -hmm. And with the work with LSD, with psilocybin, both from the 50s and 60s and the recent work, there's a correlation between the depth of the mystical experience and therapeutic outcomes. Mm -hmm. Now, MDMA is different. So, mm -hmm. so in addition to that spiritual sense, you talked about the filters that we see life through. And a lot of those filters are based on traumas, mm -hmm. on different things that have happened to the, us in the past that are coloring our sense of, is it a safe world? Is it a dangerous world? And so that's where MDMA comes in. MDMA can help us with these filters that are stories from the past that aren't not necessarily uh, relevant to the actual future interactions. Mm -hmm. And the, the essence of PTSD is that you see everything through these filters. Mm -hmm. And you can be out in public, you can be safe, you can hear a noise and it reminds you of a bullet. Mm -hmm. You know, So what we've found with MDMA therapy is that people are able to approach fearful emotions in a much more open way mm -hmm. to process the fear that was overwhelming before and we've studied, we use the same measure of mystical experience that's used in the work with LSD and psilocybin, and we do not find a correlation oh, between the mystical experience and therapeutic outcomes from PTSD. Interesting. So basically the traumas and the filters have come from um, what's happened to us during our biography, mm. and that you need to be centered in your ego, in your biography, and remembering your exact memories from childhood, from other incidents that have happened to you, and approaching them in a different way. Mm -hmm. And also, MDMA um, reduces activity in the amygdala, where we process fear. It increases activity in the prefrontal cortex, where we think logically. But very importantly, it increases connectivity between the hippocampus and the amygdala, mm. which is where we process memories into long-term storage. Mm. And so there's been kind of like a clogged drain, you could say. These traumatic memories are stuck, and they seem like they're always about to be happening. Yeah. And with MDMA, you can, um, and, and other therapies can do this too. It's not just sure. unique to MDMA, but sure. that, that you can um, take these previously um, terrifying memories and then... Uh, look at them more dispassionately, place them in the past. They're part of your journey, but they're not your entire story. And you can put them in long-term memory and you have a sense of peacefulness about it. And so then the, the what's called fear extinction and memory reconsolidation. So fear extinction is you no longer are triggered by those things. And memory reconsolidation means that we used to think that memory was like taking a book off the shelf and then you read it and then you stick it back. But mm -hmm. it turns out that memory is taking a book off the shelf you read it, you remember it, but then you have to reprint the book and you put it back. And that's how memories get changed over time, according to our, you know. That's how you can change needs. your past, essentially. That's how you change your past. And so what we're essentially doing with MDMA is bringing memories from the past that are traumatic. We find that people's memories for trauma is increased under MDMA. So it actually has a memory-enhancing effect. And these memories are tagged with terror terrifying emotions. Mm -hmm. But when you look at them from a peaceful perspective, you put them in the past, when you reconsolidate the memories, you've swapped out the emotional content to the episodic memory. So people's episodic memory is enhanced and you've swapped out the emotional tone to it. Mm. And that's the memory reconsolidation. And so then in the future, mm. when you remember that thing again, You've got the memory, but you don't have the terror and the fear. Yeah. The, the emotional association is now severed. Yes, and right. so I think that's why there is no direct connection between the mystical experience with MDMA for PTSD and um, how change actually happens in that way. That's very interesting. Um, it's almost like with MDMA, you're first and foremost going to have to deal with your stuff. And, and that has to happen before you can let go enough 
to maybe deploy the other psychedelics, which can facilitate something that is beyond your own personal biography and more. It, it helped. More I, I think in the future, when when we have thousands and thousands of psychedelic clinics all yeah. over America and all over the yeah. world, yeah. I think a lot of times people will start with MDMA. That's right. And they will move through um, cleaning their filters. Sure. And and learning how to let go and right. learning things that are terrifying can be processed, and then we'll move to more of the classic psychedelics like LSD yeah. or psilocybin or ayahuasca yeah. or ibogaine or, or well, peyote, it's mescaline. It's, it's interesting you say that. There's a British philosopher called David Pierce. Mm. He wrote the this treatise called The Hedonistic Imperative, <laughs> where he challenges us to deploy biotechnologies and ecstatic technologies to radically transform subjectivity and, and develop gradients of bliss for ourselves beyond mm. measure. And he has a whole section on... MDMA, hmm. pharmacology, and, and whatnot. He spends a lot of time writing about it. And there's one section that, that struck me is that he said that MDMA was a glimpse of the perfect human state. Yeah, yeah. Um, but then he went on to say that classic psychedelics, while potentially can be quite useful and, and transformative for people, but that he nonetheless stopped short of saying everyone should do them because the risks of a bad trip were too great. But he didn't say that for MDMA. He said MDMA, everyone <laughs> should try. And it's interesting because, you know, in my in my my own experimentation, I, I, I've I've always been a fan of cannabis. And, uh -huh. and, and, Me too. <laughs> and, you know, I think we had a conversation about, like, cannabis can take you as far as LSD if you let it. And yeah. I find it to be very psychoactive and very resonant with set and setting and all the same um, frameworks and, and planning that go into a classic psychedelic trip, I think have to be deployed for cannabis so that you mm -hmm. have a good trip. And when I was, but I, but I, in, cur in being curious about other classic psychedelics, um, I was like, mm, not sure, but MDMA, yes, because I recognized in, in a lot of my own story, a lot of the, the things related to trauma, anxiety, hypervigilance, a temperament that brings the past fear to the doorstep of every moment, that really spoke to me. And, and I read a book by a guy called David Lenson. He's a comparative literature professor. He wrote a book about the phenomenology of altered states. It's called mm. On Drugs. Mm. And there was one section where he was getting into um, this idea that consciousness is a collaboration between subject and object. Mm. And so really consciousness is, is like an equation. It's, it's person multiplied by place multiplied by time, which reveals, again, a garden of forking paths of possible experiences that you can have. And then he wrote, he went into a section where he talked about like anxiety or like bad trips or trauma. Mm -hmm. And he described anxiety, and I thought this was great. He described it as temporal dislocation, hmm. right? So when we talk about a, a past experience that was so impactful in a negative way, yeah. right, yeah. that we don't fully digest it, we now bring that past experience to the doorstep of every moment. It becomes yes, yes. the filters yeah. through which we approach life. Like I, this scary thing happened to me and it like solidified into these lenses of fear. And now everywhere I look, I'm looking for that exactly. past sensation, right? And your brain, you know, we got to love our brains. It's trying to protect us. That, that yeah, trauma yeah. is because our brain is like, well, I'm not going to take any chances on that happening again. Yeah. So he says the past trauma is now over determining the present exactly misperceiving what's happening now Cla you're not yeah. seeing what it is you know you're seeing what you are you yeah. don't see the world yeah. as it is you see the world as you so you're over determining the present and then from this because the brain is a prediction machine from this misrepresenting or misreading of the present you're now projecting a future right that becomes identified with death doom despair whatever it is and so I thought this was fascinating because it made yeah. me just un it made me crystallize a complex subject. It was like, oh, it's just temporal dislocation. So I have to yeah. freaking go back to those things, perhaps through the rose colored lenses of an MDMA yeah. experience yeah. and change my relationship with the past. Right. And then you can see more possibilities in the present and right. you're not colored by that. But right. I, I would add one um, uh, cautionary note sure. to this idea that everybody should take MDMA. Okay. Um, well, the, in, in controlled environments okay. and with guides. All right. Well, um, a lot of people do um, benefit from taking MDMA in the celebratory context without guides and all-night dance parties or festivals um, yeah. of all over the world, which I think can be incredibly healing. So I think we've pathologized uh, recreation. Mm. You know, So when you hear about recreational drugs, that's yeah. somehow hedonistic yeah, and yeah. destructive and reckless— um, and MDMA, 
is the most inherently therapeutic of all the psychedelics. Oh, and a tell lot me more about that. I like that. Well, a lot of people the the essence of our therapeutic approach is that we help people to heal themselves. Yeah. We're not like the magic surgeon going into your brain and doing the work. The we're creating a safe place for you to heal yourself. Mm. And you have to face the fears, you have to process the emotions. And so to, to give an example, I think that if people are um, willing to face whatever happens, whatever emotions come up, then MDMA could be tremendously helpful. But, but this is years ago, about 10 years ago, we were contacted by, um, we, in one week, two women contacted us. Both of them said, essentially the same thing, that they had had uh, recreational experiences at parties, they'd taken MDMA, and they had remembered prior sexual abuse and sexual assault. One of them told the story about how they were with a bunch of friends, and the friends didn't want to talk about it. They only wanted to be party, they wanted to be lighthearted, and so this woman stuffed her feelings down, mm. and then months later she still felt worse. Mm. Mm. The other woman told a different story. She was with a girlfriend. They went off into the corner of the party. She talked about what happened. She processed it. And then an hour later, she's able to go back to the party. Right. So I think that it's, it's the essence also of what our approach is, is MDMA-assisted psychotherapy. It's the psychotherapy. It's the context. It's sure. the approach sure. that really makes the, the drug experience. The drug is a catalyst, but how you approach it is really important. So... It is uh, that that's the qualification that people, if yeah, they were to sense. take it, they need to do it in a way where they're open to whatever emerges. They have enough support, if possible, for that. Open to but I emerges. do believe so. Maps is basically a nonprofit pharmaceutical company trying to develop psychedelics and cannabis into prescription medicines. And where we're different than most pharmaceutical companies, there's many different ways. But one way is we think people should have access to these drugs without having to go through their doctors or through some religious freedom arguments, that these drugs should be available in a system called licensed legalization. Hmm. Like you have to get a driver's license to yeah. drive a car, you should have a license to do drugs. Cool. And this license is basically easy to get, and um, if you misbehave, you get punished for your misbehavior, and then you lose your license to buy the drugs for a period of time. So sure. the classic example is dr drunk drivers. So right. there's a lot of drunk drivers who end up losing their driver's license, they still buy alcohol, though, and they yeah. kill people even without their driver's license. Yeah. Yeah. So because we know now about commerce and credit cards and instantaneous evaluation of you got a, enough balance left in your credit cards, yeah. that we should have a license like that to buy drugs. Mm. And so I think that we should be moving to a post-prohibition world. The other limitation of medicine, of medicalizing psychedelics, is it's only for diagnosable diseases. Mm -hmm. And so, for example, couples therapy is one of the very best uses of MDMA, but we've even had discussions with uh, some of the FDA consultants that we have, and there's no way to make MDMA into a medicine for couples therapy because it's not a disease. You can't make uh, but, psychedelics. But, but you can prescribe somebody Xanax for anxiety. and, and Well, anxiety. Yes, anxiety is a disorder, and you have to do research to show so, that it helps so, with anxiety. So, but But— couple being married can <laughs> cause a tremendous amount of anxiety coexisting with another human with their yeah. shit and your shit coexisting can cause tremendous amount of anxiety i yeah. mean I, couldn't we re reframe the whole thing and be like hey by the way being alive and sentient yeah can make you very susceptible to micro ptsd <laughs> contemplating mortality can make you susceptible to ptsd well and also this insight that we talked about about the connection with the rest of the world yes you know i mean reading the newspaper generates ptsd wars here wars there missiles there what's going on with the environment what's yeah. going on with species the, exactly you know i just read the other day about how there used to be um just enormous numbers of salmon that would uh, spawn every year, and now yeah. people are predicting in uh, 20 years the salmon might be gone. Certain sure, kind of and, salmon. It, and, and the media, if it bleeds, it leads to begin with because it's wired for our amygdala, and we're wired to pay more attention to that which is dangerous, which further even warps the interpretation yeah. of the information, which is like, again, we're wired for danger is what kept us alive in the past. So 
Yeah, I mean, I, I just feel that you, on that basis alone, yeah. you could argue that to be alive and sentient makes you susceptible to PTSD, mm -hmm. and thus you should have access to these ecstatic well, technologies. Yes, and there's another aspect of it, which is uh, fundamental human rights. So also if we true. talk about the um, Constitution of America, and we've got the freedom of the press, the freedom of assembly, the freedom of speech, the freedom of religion, and underlying all of them is the freedom of thought. Inside our own brains, when we're deep in contemplation, the freedom to think certain ideas or to explore certain states of consciousness is fundamental. Mm -hmm. And so the prohibition against drugs is a prohibition against fundamental human rights to freedom of thought. And so, but how do we get there? So we get there by focusing on pain, mm -hmm. on where the society is hurting, That's right. where they're willing to accept something new because right. maybe that will help them out of the pain that they're suffering. Yeah, and where the pain is the most acute is where you're less likely to, to face um, resistance when you're yeah. making your case for using these medicines. You know, and some of the work to get into yes. it quickly with, with MDMA, you worked with you know, people who have suffered horrific trauma, yeah. army, veterans, people yeah. who have been to war and who yeah. have seen things that they can't unsee necessarily and the traditional treatments aren't working. Right. And you've had, what is the success rate with MDMA? Like 80%? Well, well um, one year after the last MDMA experience, two thirds. Two thirds. No longer have PTSD. And this is severe, chronic, treatment resistant PTSD. So it's remarkable. And of the one-third that still have PTSD, a lot of them have had clinically significant reductions in their symptoms. Right. And on the basis of that, we're now in phase three, the final stage of research to make a drug into a medicine. Over the history of MAPS since 1986, uh, we just added up, astonishingly, we've raised over $75 million in donations, all charitable money. Wow. Phase three is going to cost us around $34 million. We've now enrolled... Um, 60 of what we hope will be 200 in order to make this drug into a medicine. We're also trying to move to Europe, and we need to raise another uh, 8 million or so for Europe. We've raised already 2 million. Um, we have a training for therapists in uh, the first week of October coming up. Mm -hmm. We have um, uh, eight people coming from China, therapists and psychiatrists. From so from China, we're, we're, we've got people all over the world that are really interested. We just mm -hmm. had a discussion with people as I said, in New Zealand and England who are interested in MDMA. Mm -hmm. So we are now focusing on a um, painful point of the culture, which is this trauma. But it's, it's interesting and strategic. I'll just point out that the first thing that you started talking about was the veterans. Mm -hmm. So what we needed from a strategic point of view is a patient population that's appreciated by the culture. So the sad part is that there are way more women that have suffered sexual abuse and rape that have PTSD from that than war-related PTSD. And yet you're getting more attention because of the veterans. Because mm. that's such a big thing in our society. Mm. So we had to be very strategic about what we're mm. doing. And so I, I like to say that we, do, we don't really do science. We do political science. Mm -hmm. We mm -hmm. had to do a lot of strategy about which psychedelic we would start with and then which patient population we would work with. Mm -hmm. And it had to be a patient population that people appreciated for yeah. which there were... Mm. Um, Wow. The traditional um, drugs didn't work, left a lot of people. It was obvious to the field, to psychiatrists, yeah. to psychologists, and to yeah. the, the culture. Yeah. And we've got roughly 20 veterans a day committing suicide. Yeah. It's horrific. And, and, and it's interesting, you know, just to, to wrap things up about what I think makes MDMA such a incredible medicine for the treatment of PTSD with psychotherapy is you once mentioned uh, what the optimal arousal zone. Yes, yes. So if you think, the analogy is kind of like planet Earth. It just happens to be in the right Goldilocks yes. spot, just close enough from the sun, not too far, not too close, <laughs> just perfect for life to emerge. It just somehow works. And what's uncanny about MDMA is exactly this thing. It's like, well, it dampens activity in the amygdala where our fear and trauma is. Yeah. It might just cloud the, the therapy to begin with boosts prefrontal cortex activity, stimulates, because it's sort of yeah. an amphetamine derivative, but then makes mm. you feel like relaxed and at ease. Yeah. And those four quadrants, you know, that's like optimal arousal zone for psychotherapy. It puts you in the sweet spot yeah. for the kind of spontaneous self-healing to emerge, yeah, the so body intelligence, as you call exactly. it. Exactly. So, so if you're hyper-vigilant, if you're over-aroused... I, I am hyper-vigilant. Er everything triggers you. Yes. And then, Many things trigger me, yes. Uh, 
Yeah, and it's hard yes. to do therapy when you're hyper aroused. When That's right. On the other hand, most pharmaceutical medicines for PTSD make you under aroused. Right. They Xanax. dampen everything. The benzos. They, they they're sort of dep- they they cut off the highs, but they cut right. off the lows, right. and and you're kind of. But it's hard to do therapy when you're sedated. sort of muted and sedated. So the MDMA brings people into this optimal arousal zone where people are able to process mm. trauma. They're able to feel their emotions, but they're not overwhelmed by their emotions and in a safe, supportive way. And I, I should add that um, the way we've designed our studies was to optimize therapeutic outcomes. And so what it turns out, like all, a lot of us are traumatized by different things, but some people, some small fraction actually develop chronic PTSD. Mm-hmm. And those people tended to have a sequence of traumas earlier in their life. Not always, some people are just traumatized by something in their adult life, but most people have who have chronic severe treatment resistant PTSD have had childhood traumas as well. So our therapeutic process is a male female co-therapy team. And we could be more uh, modern and say male identified or female identified, or they could be um, mm-hmm. you know, non-binary and all, all that. But the idea is that, that you've got this uh, supportive structure that many people under MDMA, they talk about these childhood traumas and they didn't have support, they didn't have proper attachment. Totally. They, so to have a well-functioning kind of male-female team mm. to help you sort of sometimes even experience things that you didn't have a chance when you were young, mm-hmm. that kind of loving support. Mm-hmm. So we have a two-person therapy team. From an economic point of view, what we're wanting to do is one is gonna be a licensed therapist, the other be a student. Beautiful. And that's how we um, train the next generation of therapists and also reduce the cost. But we yeah. think the two-person team yeah. works terrific. Yeah, and so much of trauma has to do with not feeling safe. Yeah. And so it feels like, you know, the substance like MDMA maybe psychologically making you on a neurochemical level feel really safe and at ease. But then the therapist and the environment for psychotherapy brings the external context of feeling safe and at ease. And when you combine interior space ease and exterior space ease, man, now you have a powerful combination for yeah. transformational cognitive reframing and healing. Exactly. Right? And so, when we described before about how MDMA is the most inherently therapeutic of all the psychedelics, yeah. it's also the easiest to integrate mm. whatever happens because your ego is not dissolved. You can sort of take the lessons from MDMA into your daily life and mm. it even occasionally I've had moments where I felt like I'm on MDMA when I've not been on MDMA. Same. You know, we've you can learn from it. Yeah. And that's the beauty of it. And so I think that's what's really important. Also, we talked earlier on about Stan Groff. You talked about in his yeah. quotes, but he, when psychedelics were criminalized, he developed uh, an approach called holotropic breathwork, right. which was hyperventilation mm-hmm. to bring out these same experiences. And I think the key lesson from that is that. When you have these experiences like that, it's not a breathwork experience, it's not an LSD experience, it's a human experience, that these are capabilities that we have within us. And the goal of MAPS, I would say, is to make it so people don't need psychedelics, so that they have learned these lessons and we can do this more or less on our own. On the other hand, I do think that um, there's a really interesting study that was just done with lifelong meditators in the Zen tradition. And Zen has been uh, sort of more in the modern age, um, traditionally anti-psychedelic, anti-drugs, anti-intoxication. But as it turns out, this was a study that was done in Switzerland. Uh, Vanya Palmers, who was the uh, leader of the Zen tradition in Switzerland, had to leave the, his position because he wanted to start experimenting with psychedelics. And, and to be the leader of a tradition that was somewhat anti-psychedelic, it, it didn't quite work. So he left this position. And then this study he wanted to do took many, many years for him to, to do it. But a bunch of lifelong Zen meditators uh, went to the University of Zurich with Franz Vollenweider's team, and they got brain scans. Then they went into a five-day meditation retreat in Switzerland. Um, and in the middle of it, they got a pill. And it was either psilocybin or inactive placebo. Um, or niacin, I can't remember quite which, but they got uh, placebo. And then at the end of this uh, meditation retreat, they went back and got brain scans, and then they had uh, long-term follow-ups. And what they found is that even in this Zen tradition, that one experience of psilocybin helped them deepen their meditation practice, that you still, you think you're super open, but you're still channeled in certain ways. And the psychedelics bring things to the surface that you might not anticipate. So Mm -hmm. while we do want to help it so people don't need psychedelics, Mm -hmm. maybe 
you know, throughout the lifespan, every once in a while, we should be doing psychedelics just to see what we're um, suppressing or not seeing. Yeah, and you know, you could also argue, you know, Michael Pollan talks about the been there's and seen that's of the adult mind, you know, uh -huh. the set of algorithms we build yeah. up into adulthood that essentially allow us to run our lives on autopilot. Yes. His words are, the good news is you're seldom surprised, right? Nothing ever <laughs> sidelines you. But the bad news is you're seldom surprised, yeah. you know? And so these kinds of experiences potentially could evoke a kind of, in his words, the sense of first sight unencumbered by knowingness, you know, <laughs> to get to look at ourselves with a virginal noticing, to get to look at our lives with a virginal noticing, to notice the sublime miracle that it is to be alive. You know, F. Scott Fitzgerald wrote about these transitory enchanted moments in which man must have held his breath, compelled into aesthetic contemplations face to face with something can measure it to our capacity for wonder. And it is there that we heal and we all deserve access to these domains and yeah. so i just want to salute you in ending for the work you do to alleviate human suffering and eventually to make well people better <laughs> exactly and i think that the um the 50 years since the psychedelic first came onto the scene in a major way in the 60s and was identified with the counterculture yeah that we have grown as a culture as a global culture over these last 50 years and so I do believe that we have a really good opportunity to integrate psychedelics into the culture. And I think one of the mistakes of the 60s was that these drugs are the province of the rebels and the counterculture. Yeah. What we're trying to do now is, is mainstream them and yeah. to make it so that these are the province of, of everyone. And I feel that the world is hungry for yeah. this kind of new globalization. We know that technology is expanding at an enormous rate. We're talking about sending you know ships potentially to Mars, we're, we're expanding into the cosmos, and the cultures are bumping up against each other. The environmental destruction is uh, almost uh, too late, but hopefully not too late. And so there's this hunger that we're trying to address towards a different way. Mm -hmm. And I think that through the healing of trauma and the creation of spiritual sense of connection and mysticism, that we can help people surrender and let go of their literal fundamentalisms and move to a deeper spirituality. Amen, brother. <laughs> Thank you so much, Rick. <laughs> magnificent to share some space and time what with you. What a pleasure, Jason. I am so glad to uh, live in the 21st century where I could fly from ocean to ocean Oof. just to be with you and then get on an airplane in a few hours. Well, I, I am honored and humbled to grace your presence <laughs> and uh, wish you a great next leg of your journey, and I'm sure I'll see you soon. Last time we hung out this long, we were in Oslo together. That's right, at the yeah, Human Rights Foundation, right. which Rights is Foundation. Yeah. really important. That's this right. fundamental appreciation right. for human rights and the courage of yeah. those people that are willing to stand up for it and also the trauma that they experience and how we need to help heal our human rights activists. Absolutely. Thank you, Ray. Thank you, Jason. Thank you, Flo Kana. Thank you, Flo Kana. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.